Well, shalom everyone and welcome to our Shabbat night service. It is November 18, 2022, and we are excited about everything that Jehovah is revealing to us in his word. And we are so grateful for the care that Jehovah takes by watching over us and keeping us and sending the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to guide us into all truth, opening up our hearts and minds to receive all that the Spirit will reveal to our spirit. So we are just excited. We have this new decline, getting our hearts and minds ready. We don't own the rights to this music. We just use it as a way of getting our hearts and minds ready to receive. We want to get rid of the clutter and everything that's been going on in our lives on today and devote this opportunity as even in California now, it is the vibe. And so we are just happy that we have the opportunity to study together. And we are excited about the revelation that comes from the word and the blessings that comes from obedience. We're learning more and more that to obey returns blessings. And so we are just excited about what's going on and we're going to listen to this music for a few, couple of more minutes. Yes, a couple of more minutes. Then we're going to begin our class for tonight. We are in, that this is lesson number six. We will be in Genesis chapter 19. I mean, sorry, chapter 25, verse 19, all the way to chapter 28, verse 9. Well, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 25, verse 19 is where our lesson will begin. And we're going to go all the way through chapter 28, verse 9. Line up one line, precept upon precept. We're going to let that word minister to our hearts because faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of Jehovah, our fellow man. That he has given to Moses to give to us. And we are excited about it. We had a great, a great class on Wednesday night in our Wednesday night Bible study. And we're studying the history of what we believe, and how it come about, that we believers in Yeshua, what information kind of governs our understanding of what it is to be a child of God. So don't forget to join us on Wednesday night and get those nuggets that we're sharing with one another. All right, our music is over. And I'm going to shut off this phone. So All right. All right, with that, we're going to say our prayer, then we're going to have um, the sacrament, the Holy Eucharist, or we're going to have communion, which is uh, where the Messiah Yeshua told his disciples on the night for his death. They should think of him. 
as they gather together and break bread, they should think of him and what he has done. Teach others. So we're going to pray and then get into our communion on tonight. So get your uh, bread and your wine together as Yeshua passed around on that night. And uh, let us pray. Jehovah, our Elohim, creator of all things, we thank you and we praise you for this day. For this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and we are glad in it. We bless you for the Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, that comes to guide us into all truth. We thank you for your son, Yeshua, our Messiah, who came to show us the more excellent way. And be that propitiation for our sins and our separation from you. We thank you, Yeshua, our Messiah, for reconciling us back to the Father. And we thank you that as we go through this lesson, we open up our hearts and minds to receive all that you are saying to us. And we thank you for the Ruach of Kodesh that comes to empower us to be obedient to all the instructions you give. In the name of Yeshua, Messiah, we pray this prayer. Amen. So with that, get your communion uh, elements together for the night before his death the next day. The Messiah, Yeshua, was sitting at meal with his disciples. And at the meal, he took the bread. It was a loaf of bread. It would be round like a pizza loaf. He took the bread and he told them, this is Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. He said, take and eat. This bread is a symbol of my body, my body that is broken just for you. Then he said, do it often, always in remembrance of me. And so they ate. Then he took the cup. They had a cup of wine. He took the cup and he passed it around. I'm sorry, I forgot to bless the Father for the bread and then well, we, we will bless him for the wine. He would say, Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu melech ha'alom borei pari agafein. Blessed are you, Yehovah Elohim, king of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Then he told him to pass the cup around. Take and drink for this is symbolic of my blood. My blood that is shed for the remission of your sin and for a new relationship with me. Do this often, always in remembrance of me. And so they all drank. And we thank Jehovah our Elohim for this opportunity that he has provided for us to be obedient to what Yeshua, our Messiah, told us that we should do. He said, do it in remembrance of me. And we have been obedient as we open this session. Soon we'll be in a place to where we'll have a meal together. And as we have that meal together, we will continue to follow the instructions of our Messiah and break bread together and eat and drink in honor of the price the Messiah paid for us. So just give me one or a few seconds. I got to go get me a cup. I forgot my cup on the other table.
All right, Afs, I've had a busy, very busy day here today. As, as we're closing up this project, most days are quite busy. So I get an opportunity right around 3.30 or 4 o'clock to kind of just take a deep breath, put my notes in my daily journal, and then prepare my mind by listening to music and just meditating on the word. So thank you again for joining me. Now let's get our screen changed. Uh, what is that new? Something new came up. <laughs> okay, there it goes. I'm telling you, you know, like something, something new will happen, and I'll be like, uh oh, what should I do now? And so I didn't get an opportunity to really, let me see what it is. I can find it. No, no, it's not cool. No, okay. Okay, so let us begin our lesson. Amen. This is our Shabbat night. Remember, this is the beginning of the seventh night. It goes from sundown to, to on Friday to sundown on Saturday. And that is in accordance with uh, what was displayed in Genesis, where there was evening and morning, and that completes one day. And so we're in the word Hebrew word todo, which means generations. And we'll see that in our lesson as we go into our lesson on tonight. We're going to be in Genesis 25, verse 19 to 28, verse 9. Lesson number six of 52 lessons through the Torah in one year. And so let's go into our introduction. Oh, wait a minute, I gotta get into my slide presentation. Yes, all right, now let's get into our introduction page. And there that word is generations, generation. The Hebrew word toldot means generations. It could also mean history. Um, but we're going to use generations on tonight. See, the one thing about a Strong's Concordance that breaks down Hebrew and Greek into English, that it'll give you a, a litany of words that could mean the word told oh, all of the words that in English that could be uh, synonymous with that word in Hebrew. But it doesn't tell you how to, which one of those words you should use, eliminate others because of the what? The basic content and context of the Hebrew. So we try to go to a Hebrew translation of the scriptures from Hebrew to English so that we can then, in fact, uh, make some of those transitional changes that are so necessary. Um, these are the generations of Isaac, son of Abraham, be, begins the reading. We will learn of the birth of Jacob and Esau, how they got their different ways, and how rather circuitously Isaac bestowed the all-important blessings on Jacob. The commentaries explain that this was not merely a blessing, but the symbolic handling over of the Jewish legacy to the next generation. In other words, this is for the seed that the promise would originate and be tracked. In spiritual terms, Jacob and Esau represent two diametrically opposed inclinations in each and every one of us. Our desire to serve Elohim, our God, and our desire to serve ourselves. So we have this battle going on in our minds all the time. That's why we have to meditate on the word so that we will make the correct choice into which action uh, we will guide our behavior towards. Jacob represents spirituality, humility, and meekness, while Esau represents physical physicality, arrogance, and aggression. Not only was there a battle within Rebecca, but in all of us. 
these two twins struggle, always vying for control over the other. We can learn from the journey of Isaac that faith means the courage to persist through all the setbacks, all the grief, never giving up, never accepting defeat. For at the end, despite the opposition, the envy, the haters, the doubters, the uh, lies, or that lie, not meaning in the untruth, but lies the serenity of reaching the destination after overcoming all the storms along the way. Remember, each stone, each stepping stone, each storm in our life is an opportunity for us to grow in our trust of Yehovah Elohim and the unctions of the Ruach HaKodesh, our Holy Spirit. So with that, we're going to get into our lesson today, Genesis chapter 25, beginning with verse 19. Here is the generations of Zizak, or Isaac, Abraham's son. These are Hebrew names that have meaning, and so in the translation I use, it will have these names. Abraham fathered Zizak, Yitzak. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rivka or Rebekah, the daughter of Batuel, the Armenian from Padam Aran, and the sister of Laban, the Armenian, to be his wife or the army. Yitzhak prayed to Jehovah on behalf of his wife because she was childless. Jehovah heeded his prayer, and Rivka or Rebekah became pregnant. The children fought with each other inside her so much that she said, if it's going to be like this, why go on living? So this was a very difficult pregnancy, which once again goes to our state in a world that is intent on disavowing even the existence of Jehovah, our Elohim. So, Rebecca or Rivka went to inquire of Jehovah, who answered her, there are two nations in your womb. From birth, there will be two rival peoples. One of these peoples will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger, meaning the younger will be the one that should get the birth, right, of the eldest. When the time came for her delivery, there were twins in her womb. The first, come out with, the first to come out was reddish, covered all over with hair like a coat. So they named him Esau, completely formed, that is, having a lot of hair on his body, being very hairy. Then verse 26, his brother emerged with his hand holding Esau's heel. So he was called Yaakov. He catches by the heel or he supplants. Most of the time, we're going to say he, he supplants, but Yaakov in its root meaning means catches by the heel. Yishak was 60 years old when she bore them. So now we know he got married at 40, so there was a 20-year period when she did not get pregnant. The boys grew, and Esau became a skillful hunter and outdoorsman, while Yaakov was a quiet man who stayed in the tents. And when you look at that stayed in the tents, that doesn't mean he didn't. Many times they said of the shepherd who watched over the sheep that they stayed in the tents. Isaac favored Esau because he had a taste for game and Rivka or Rebecca favored Yaakov. So one day when Yaakov had cooked some stew, Esau came in from the open country exhausted and said to Yaakov, please let me gulp down some of that red stuff. And that's kind of a take on even his name because his name actually meant can mean red or hairy or eat them when we get into later parts of our study. That red, I'm exhausted. This is why he was called Adam, or what we say, Edom, or Red. So 
Another name for Esau became Adam, which meant red. These names mean something. And so therefore, a child could have three, four names because the name meant something. Yaakov answered, first, sell me your rights as the firstborn. Look, I'm about to die, said Esau. What use to me are my rights as the firstborn? Now, in many cases, there were two aspects to being oldest. Number one, you got double uh, because your lineage was passing directly through you. You would get double for your upkeep of the rest of the family and for yourself and the rest of the family would get the other third. So you would get two thirds and the rest of the family would get one third. It also usually meant the priestly line because the oldest was considered to be the most knowledgeable and the one who would study to be a priest. So in essence, in the mind of Esau, he was rejecting the spirituality and not necessarily the physical aspects of blessing of his father. Yaakov said, first swear to me. So he swore to him. So now Esau is going to what? Have to deal with what he just did because out of his mouth says he is giving that birthright to Yaakov. Then Yaakov gave him bread and lentil stew. He ate and drank, got up and went on his way. Thus Esau showed how little he valued his birthright, especially <laughs> meaning the birthright of the priest or the religious, what we would call the religious head of the family after the death of the father. Chapter 26, the famine came over the land, not the same as the first famine, which had taken place when Abraham was alive. Yigzak went to Gerar and Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Jehovah appeared to him and said, don't go down into Egypt, but live where I tell you. That is the exact difference of what Abraham did because Abraham went into Egypt and it's fascinating that each time there was a difficulty, they would turn back to Egypt and help get them out of the situation they were in. He says, but live where I tell you. Stay in this land and I will be with you and bless you because I will give all these lands to you and to your descendants. I will fulfill the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will give all these lands to your descendants and by your descendants, all the nations of the earth will bless themselves. Notice when Jehovah gives this promise to Gizak, it's when there's a famine. So he's telling him, you don't have to leave. I will take care of you. I don't want you to leave the land of Canaan because this is what I'm going to give to your descendants. Also talking about descendants, letting him know I will take care of you and your children. And we go on. All this, he says, Jehovah says to uh, Yaakov, all this is because Abraham heeded what I said and did what I told him to do. See the blessings that are passed on to our children and our children's children when we are doing what? When we are obedient and do what Jehovah has told us to do. He followed my commands, my mitzvot, my regulations and my teachings. Remember, Abraham always got up quickly to do what he had been instructed by Jehovah to do. So Isaac or Yizak settled in Gerar. The men of the place asked him about his wife. And out of fear, he said, just like with Abraham, Abraham, she is my sister. He thought, if I tell them she's my wife, they will kill me in order to take Rivka or Rebecca, after all, she is a beautiful woman. Remember, if he's 60, she's more like in her 30s. 
early 30s. So this took place after he was 60 years old. Uh, after that particular time, well, even more than that, it would have been closer to 80 or so because his two sons had had this had a situation. So we're going to get into the situation as it goes back into the story. But she was much younger than him, at least 25, 30 years younger than Isaac. But one day after he had lived there a long time, Avimelech, king of the Philistines, happened to be looking out of a window when he spotted Isaac caressing Rebecca, his wife, Rebecca, his wife. Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, so she is your wife after all. How come you said she is my sister? Yizek responded, because I thought I could get killed because of her. Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people could easily have slept with your wife. How would they do that other than through rape? All right. Did they think they had a right to rape her? And you would have brought guilt on us. No, he would not have brought guilt. If she didn't want to have relationship, which she would not have, then they can't just, if you take it, you, you raped her. And so the king is saying, uh, you know, you would have brought this guilt upon us because you know, because of the way your people behave and what you do. Then Abimelech warned all the people, whoever touches this man or his wife, will certainly be put to death. Isaac planted crops in that land and reaped that year a hundred times as much as he had sowed. Jehovah had blessed him. So we noticed there, we highlighted that hundred times as much because we noticed that Isaac kept good records of what he planted and what he, what he sowed and what he reaped. And he's also making a notation, right, that out of that, he probably be talking about the fact that he offered sacrifices to Jehovah in the form of him, just as Abraham had done. He had flocks, cattle, and a large household, and the Philistines envied him. Now, the Philistines had stopped up and filled with dirt all the wells his father's servants had dug during the lifetime of Abraham, his father. Avimelech said to Yitzhak, you must go away from us because you have become much more powerful than we are. Once again, the wealth and everything that was being bestowed because of obedience to Yaakov, the Philistines envy. And even during the famine, he was doing what? Getting a hundred times as much. Every seed he planted would grow. And so he had become very wealthy indeed. He had flocks, cattle, and a large household, and the Philistines envied him. We're gonna, I repeated that, I'm sorry. Now the Philistines have stopped up and filled with dirt. See what envy does? In the desert, wells are the most precious thing that you could have. But rather than use the wells for their benefit, they filled them up with dirt so that it wouldn't be known that Abraham had dug the well. Isaac, you must go away from us. So we'll get to verse 17. So I, Isaac, or Isaac left, set up camp in Badi Galar and lived there. Isaac reopened the wells which had been dug during the lifetime of Abraham, his father. That's important to understand. Wells are the most important thing in the desert dry land. Why would you fill them up rather than acknowledge that someone else dug them or had claimed to them you were more powerful? But now as he's getting flocks and land and everything he's doing is prospering and a Jehovah is protecting him, then they tell him to go. Rather than just try to take it, they say, you go away. Isaac's servants dug in the body and uncovered a spring of running water. 
But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Yazak, herdsmen, claiming that water is ours. So he called the well a say, which means to crawl. Because they quarreled with him, they dug another well and crawled over that one too. So he called it Sitna, meaning enmity. He went away from there and dug another well. And over that one, they didn't wall. So they had enough now. <laughs> the other two that Yisak gave to them, even knowing that he had dug them, allowing them, you just go ahead, I'll make, I'll get enough. So he called it Rehovot, meaning wide open spaces and said, because now Jehovah has made room for us and we will be productive in this new land. So now he said, since we're not arguing and fighting, that means Jehovah has stepped in and now we have peace. From there, Yizak went up to Beersheba. Jehovah appeared to him that same night and said, I am the Elohim of Abraham, your father. Don't be afraid because I am with you. I will bless you and increase your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. Remember in the place called Beersheba, meaning the wells, is where Abraham had settled. And then come back to settle after the whole situation with Isaac, his son. From there, I said, and he goes on, I will bless you and increase your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. There he built an altar and called on the name of Jehovah. He probably saw or, or rebuilt the altar that his father had built. It, father Abraham had built there. He pitched his tent there, and there his ex-servants dug a well. Then Abimelech went to Gerar with his friend Ahuzat and Picot the commander of his army. Yizak said to them, why have you come to me, even though you were unfriendly to me and sent me away? They answered, we saw very clearly that Jehovah has been with you. So we said, let there be an oath between us. Now they sought him out. Things not going too well there, but everywhere he goes, Jehovah is blessing him. Let's make a pact between ourselves and you. Fact is that you will not harm us, just as we have not caused you offense, but have done you nothing but good and sent you on your way in peace. So now they say we did you a good thing. Uh, we didn't want any problems, so we sent you away, but we didn't want try to take what you had, nor do we cause war against you. He says, so that was good. We treated you good, even though Yaakov had already told him, you didn't do me right. You sent me away from a place that I had made my home. He says, now you are blessed by Jehovah. Is that prepare a banquet for them? And they ate and drank. The next, this is the whole kindness and the ability to get along with others that he had learned from his father Abraham. That very day, his ex servants came and told him about the well they had dug. We have found water, they did found another one. So he called it Shiva, oh, or seven. That is seven wells for them that they had dug around that place. For this reason, the name of the city is Be'er Sheba. Sheba. Well, remember, that's where Abraham settled in dug away. So it is a total of seven wells in that area to this day. When Esau was 40 years old, now he's gone to 40 years old, right? So remember, it was at least 60 years old when they were born to Isaac. So if he's 40, that means Isaac is 100 now. He's over, at least over 100 years old. He took wives of the Hittites or the Yehudi, the daughter of Harer, the Hittite, and Basmat, 
the daughter of Elon, the Hittite or the Hitti. But they became a cause for embitterment of spirit to Isaac and Rivka or Yitzhak and Rivka. In other words, they didn't want their sons to marry someone from the land, just as Abraham had taught them, because you're going to create problems in terms of the promise that you have been given. So keep yourself in line. Chapter 27. In the course of time, after Isaac or Yitzhak had grown old and his eyes dim, so that he couldn't see, he called, he saw his older son and said to him, my son. And he answered, here I am. Look, I am old now. I don't know when I will die. Therefore, please take your hunting gear, your quiver of arrows and your bow. Go out in the country and get me some game. Make it tasty the way I like it and bring it to me to eat then I will bless you as firstborn before I die. Now that is in direct contradiction with what I am certain Rebecca or Rivka would have told him concerning what was going on with what Jehovah had said before the twins were born. Rivka was listening. When, remember, they lived in a tent. Okay? So he was just behind another curtain. When Isaac or Yitzhak spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went out to the country to hunt for game and bring it back, she said to her son Yaakov, listen, I heard your father telling Esau, your brother, Esau, your brother, bring me game and make it tasty so that I can eat it. Then I will give you my blessing in the presence of Jehovah before my death. And you saw Isaac can't see me. So he thinks he's going to die. Now pay attention to me, my son, and do what I tell you, Rivka said. Go to the flock and bring me back two choice kids, two little brand new goats. I will make it tasty for your father the way he likes it. And you will bring it to your father to eat so that he will give his blessing to you before his death. Fascinating. We don't quite understand the depth of what's going on here. But the fact that Rebecca felt that she had to deceive Isaac in order for him to do what Jehovah had explained to her that she had explained to him to do. Yaakov answered Rivka, his mother. Look, he saw his hairy, but I have smooth in. So Yaakov doesn't want to do it. It's like his spirit is saying, you don't have to do that. So he don't want to do it. He says, suppose my father touches me. He'll know I'm trying to trick him. And I'll bring a curse on myself, not a blessing. But his mother said, let your curse be on me. So she's not saying it's not necessarily wrong. But what she's saying that the result or the outcome of this, I am responsible for just listen to me and go get me the kids. So now Yaakov is understanding that his mother is saying, I'm as your mother telling you that this is what you ought to do. And so he's making the decision to go and do it. So he went, got them and brought them to his mother and his mother prepared them in the tasty way his father loved. Next, Rivka took Esau, her oldest son's best clothes, which she had with her in the, in the tent, right? In the home or in the tent, and put them on Yaakov, her younger son. And she put the skins of the goats on his hands and on the smooth parts of his neck. Then she gave the tasty food and the bread she had prepared to her son Yaakov. He went in to his father and said, my father. He replied, here I am. Who are you, my son? Yaakov said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done what you asked me to do. Get up now, sit down, eat the game, and then give me your blessing. 
Yitzhak said to his son, how did you find it so quickly, my son? And he answered, Yehovah, your Elohim made it happen that way. There's a whole lot. In, he basically said, Yehovah is in this. But he didn't want to do it, but his mother told him, you have to do it because I'm commanding you almost to be obedient to what I'm saying. I know better than you. Verse 21, Yitzhak said to Yaakov, come here close to me so I can touch you, my son, and know whether you are in fact my son Esau or not. Yaakov approached Yitzhak, his father, who touched him and said, the voice is Yaakov's voice, but the hands are Esau's hands. However, he didn't detect him. Hmm. Another interesting point that he says that the voice is not the voice of Esau. It's like Yaakov is trying to disguise his voice. However, he still didn't detect him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he gave him his blessing. He asked, are you really my son Esau? And he replied, I am, he said, bring it here to me. I will eat my son's game so that I can give you my blessing. So he brought it up to him and he ate. He also brought him wine and he drinks. <laughs> he gonna really help him out. He didn't give him water, he gave him wine to drink. <laughs> To make sure this goes down. So he brought it up to him and he ate. He also brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come close now and kiss me, my son. He approached and kissed him. Yishak smelled his clothes and blessed Yaakov with these words. Remember those were the clothes of Esau, see, my son smells like a field which Jehovah has blessed. So may Elohim give you dew from heaven, the richness of the earth, and grain and wine in abundance. So he goes to him, and the first blessing is the blessing of the word coming from heaven, which is the spiritual blessing. You will be the priest of the family. The richness of the earth, in other words, the physical aspects, the blessing will come because of your obedience. And grain and wine in abundance. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. May you be Lord over your kinsmen. Let your mother's descendants bow down to you. Curse be everyone who curses you and bless be everyone who blesses you. The blessing that Jehovah gave to Abraham has been repeated to Isaac, Yaakov, and that, uh, Isaac, Yitzhak, and now he's given that same blessing, passing it on to Yaakov. But as soon as Yitzhak had finished giving his blessing to Yaakov, when Yaakov had barely left his father's presence, he saw his brother came in from his hunting. He too had prepared a tasty meal and brought it to his father. And now he said to his father, let my father get up and eat from his son's game so that you may give me your blessing. Now this blessing is much more in line with the what? Double portion, not the priestly life. He didn't care that much about that, but he definitely wants that physical aspect of the double portion. His father said to him, who are you? And he answered, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Isaac began trembling uncontrollably and said, then who was it that took game and brought it to me? I ate it all just before you came and I gave my blessing to him. That's the truth and the blessing must stand. So now it's like giving up an oath to this, to Yaakov 
that this is what Jehovah has spoken to you. So now he's saying, I can't take it back. It has to stand. He goes on. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst into loud, bitter sobbing. Father, bless me too, he begged. He replied, your brother came deceitfully and took away your blessing. Esau said, his name is Yaakov, he who supplants. Really suits him because he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright as the priest, and here now he has taken away my blessing as the head of the house. Then he said, haven't you saved a blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, look, I have made him your Lord, his master. I have given him all his kinsmen as servants, and I have given him grain and wine to sustain him. What else is there that I can do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing, my father? Father, bless me too. Esau wept aloud, and Esau, Esau, his father, answered him, here, your home will be of the richness of the earth, talking about the physical aspect, since you have rebuked and did not want the spiritual aspect, and then the dew of heaven from above. So if you treat the land well and obey what Jehovah commands, you will do well. You will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. But when you break loose, you will shake his yoke off your neck. In other words, he knows he's going to be very angry, but you have to get over that anger in order to be blessed in the manner in which Jehovah will bless you. Esau hated his brother because of the blessing his father had given him. Esau said to himself, he spoke out loud, but he wasn't, didn't know nobody was around. The time for mourning my father will come soon. Because Jacob, yeah, I mean, Ishak had told him, I think I'm about to die. Then I will kill my brother, Yaakov. But the words of Esau, her older son were told to Rebecca Rivka. She sent for Yaakov, her younger son, and said to him, Younger, he was only a couple of seconds past the birth of Esau. He was holding on to his heel. He says he's planning to kill you. Therefore, my son, listen to me. Get up and escape to Laban or Laban, my brother in Haran. Stay with them a little while until your brother's anger subsides. Your brother's anger will turn away from you, and he will forget what he did, what you did to him. <laughs> then I'll send and bring you back from there. So she's saying that they will work on the brother. He, he wouldn't do anything, of course, with his father alive, but after the death of his father, then she will work on him believing. Remember, he's at least 25, 30 years older than her, that she'll live longer than Isaac. Isaac. She says, so she goes out. Rebecca Rivka says to Yikjak, I'm sick to death of Hittite women. If your cold marriage is one of Hittite women, like those who live here, meaning with in the tent with, <laughs> with Esau, my life won't be worth living. So Yitzhak called Yaakov, and after blessing him, charged him, you are not to choose a wife from the Hittite women. Go now to the home of Batuel, your father's, your mother's father, and choose a wife there from the daughters of Laban or Laban, your mother's brother. May El Shaddai bless you, make you fruitful, and increase your descendants until they become a whole assembly of people. Yishak knows that the promise is coming through of many descendants comes through Yishak and not Esau. And may he give you the blessing which he gave Abraham 
you and your descendants with you, so that you will possess the land you will travel through, the land Elohim gave to Abraham. So Gikshak sent Yaakov away, and he went to Padam Aram to Levan, or Laban, son of Batuel the Ami, the brother of Rivka, Rebekah, Yaakov's, and Esau's mother. And we close with these last lines. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Yaakov and sent him away to Padam Aram to choose a wife from there. And that as he blessed him, he charged him, you are not to choose a Canaanite woman as your wife. So this was overheard and then removed. It's a tent, so there's only a curtain. There. So this was overheard and then reported to Esau. And that Yaakov had listened to his father and mother and gone to Padan Aram. Esau also saw that the Canaanite women did not please Yitzhak, his father. So Esau went to Ishmael, which is what? The son, the brother of Isaac, son of Abraham, and took, in addition to the wives he already had, Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham, Abraham's son, the sister of Navayo, to be his wife. So that concludes our lesson for today. So Esau recognizes the fact that one of the things that had displeased his father was the fact that he had married the Hittite women. And so they had definitely spoken their displeasure with that decision on his part. He didn't really care. But once again, when he heard that there was a blessing given to his brother, Yaakov, now he begins to think, wait a minute, maybe that's another way I can get back in good with my father and my mother is to marry a woman that they're okay with. So we'll look at the notes on our lesson and go through them quickly. Yes, we have just a few minutes left. In the garden, Jehovah Elohim gave the command for man and woman to be fruitful and multiply. However, with Sarah, Rebecca, and then Rachel, this was very difficult as they could, could not conceive. Isaac and Rebecca played for over 20 years before Rebecca became pregnant. Sarah was 90 years old when she gave birth to Isaac or Yitzhak. I believe this points out that this plan in the development of societies has Jehovah as the architect. Nothing happens without it being part of his divine plan. So we can take understanding from that. The famine caused Isaac to take the same route that his father Abraham had and going to Egypt. However, Jehovah intervenes and tells Isaac that he is not to leave the land of Canaan. Jehovah tells Isaac that his father was obedient in all the things that Jehovah had asked him to do. And by being obedient, Isaac would receive all the blessings that his father had. Isaac obeyed the voice of Jehovah and remained in the land of Canaan. And I think we're just about ready to wrap this up. Another aspect of our lesson is show the self-destructive nature of hate. The Philistine did not ask Isaac or Isaac to share his water with them. They did not ask him to teach them how he and his father had discovered a source of water that the residents of the place had not been able to find. They did not even simply ask him to move on. They stopped up the wells, filling them with earth. This act harmed them more than it harmed Isaac. Stopped up wells in the desert. It is amazing also another point to be made from our lesson of the day is it is amazing that Rebecca felt the need to trick her husband into giving the blessing to Isaac rather than Esau. It is also amazing that Isaac forgot about this lesson that was taught to him by his father, Abraham. Remember, Abraham learned 
to move every obstacle in the path of the blessing being given to Isaac. Even though Ishmael was older, he obeyed the voice of Sarah who said he wasn't right. Ishmael wasn't the promise. Isaac was the promise. Jishak was the promise. And so he obeyed that, sent him away. Then even the children he had later with Keturah after the death of Sarah, he sent all of them away so that there would be no hindrance in the blessing passing and the wealth he wanted to pass on to his son. It is certain that Rebecca had told Yitzhak or Isaac about her visitation by Jehovah while in prayer. Yet in the mind of Isaac, Isaac, he was going to give the blessing of the firstborn to Esau. So that's how things going on around us can seem so right because that's what other people are doing. But we have to focus and learn to focus on the voice of Jehovah and what is Jehovah telling us that we should do and be obedient to what we are hearing from the Ruach HaKodesh to our spirits of what we are supposed to do. This situation is also with the, with, between Esau and, and Yaakov has given Esau an opportunity to examine himself. And so he realizes that one of my problems in my relationship with my mother and father is I married these Hittite women and they didn't want me to, but I didn't care. I wanted them. So he goes to Ishmael, feeling like, no, they're not going to, they're not going to tell me I can't marry one of my uncles, daughters. They're not going to tell me that. So I will please them in doing what I'm doing. That did not eliminate the problem of the other Hittite wives, but it does show that Esau was looking to please his parents. Tragically, children from the finest homes have gone terribly astray. If we don't transmit a healthy value system to the next generation, the vacuum will very likely be filled with other willing teachers, such as the society around us, many of whom may not, we may not approve of. So if we don't teach these values and give the understanding of the scriptures to our children, and we know that in this sinful world, they have a difficult time, even as all of these false teachers have messed up the teachings of of Jehovah our Elohim through the scriptures, that we don't follow the scriptures as we should, which is one of the reasons our children don't follow what it is we're instructed in, which is the reason why we get into these classes so we can learn what it is we're supposed to do. And Jehovah will then bless us through our obedience and transfer this to our children. At least we will be that living epistle of what Jehovah has instructed us to do and follow through on that. With that, that ends our lesson for today. Let us pray. Jehovah my Elohim, we bless you for this day. This is the day you have made. And we thank you for this opportunity to come together and study your word. We thank you for the Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit that comes to guide us into all truth. And we thank you for Yeshua, our Messiah, who has come to reconcile us back to you. And as part of the gift of reconciliation, he has given us the Ruach HaKodesh to guide us on our journey in this life and to empower us to not only hear what you're saying, but to do what you would have us to do. And it's in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, that we pray, amen. All right, everyone, I'll see you on Wednesday night when we get into once again, we will get into our lesson of the belief, system of beliefs that we have been given. All right, we made it just in time. Shalom, have a great Shabbat, and I will see you Wednesday, Wednesday night for our Wednesday night Bible study. Shalom.